that kind of like saw somebody uh get human traffic and then all of a sudden he felt the need to like jump in like <laughs> and i watched the movie and i was just like i want my hour and a half back <laughs> And like, yeah, we're just gonna start this shit live. The only time I caught the Holy Ghost was when I was in church drinking. Like, they're two dumb dudes. Welcome to the latest episode of Sarah and Chris's Movie Therapy Podcast. But yeah, yeah, I know. I watched the movie this, uh, I watched the movie last night and I had a yep. long day yesterday. So partway through, I started dozing off. So I made sure I watched it again this morning to make sure I caught what I needed to catch, you know? Oh man, my man was dozing. That's not a good look. Yeah, well, I'm, bro, I'm over forty right now, man. I, I just accepted it. Oh my, we're all over forty. Like, but like, this is a movie, honestly, that I've been having on my list to watch, and I haven't watched it because I'm a person I like to watch movies uninterrupted. Yeah. So I never started it because every time I uh, I try to start it, you know, uh, my wife she'll always either be like, "Oh, what is this?" and then she'll start asking questions. <laughs> So this is a movie because I know she she only knows about Michael Keaton as Beetlejuice and Batman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the the McDonald's movie. Yeah. So she'll automatically start asking me a bunch of questions about the movie, and I'm like, I'm like, I'm not even gonna put it on. Yeah. Because I was like, hey, you want to watch it? And then she was like, sure. What is it about? And I was like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> he's like, who's Knox and where is he going? You know, like, what the hell is this? Well, with that being said, welcome to the latest episode of Surat and Chris's Movie Therapy Podcast. It's your boy Surat, aka Makazi. And today, if you couldn't already tell by seeing him and hearing the voice, I got a special guest host on the on the pod today. Chris is, you know, is a little under the weather. So, you know, in order to still bring you new content, I decided to bring on a guest host. My brother, introduce yourself. Uh, Marcos, aka the Sunset Kid co-host of xpod 97 with mega ran a uh, friend of, of this show uh i also consume the show appreciate you having me on a speedy recovery chris hope everything works out well bro i mean you know one, you know, one thing for the goes Go away is um is written by gregory uh poirier and but it, it's interesting because michael keaton is the lead and he's also the director of this particular film which i like yeah, um, and it's a 2023 American thriller drama that uh, I read the synopsis before um, I even selected it afterwards because it was just something that was in the back of my mind that I wanted to watch. Yeah, and I'm glad I did. It came out in the uh, in 2023. It was later released in 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 um, March by Saban Films, and I'm a huge Michael Keaton guy. Like yeah. I love him and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay, so but now b before we get into the movie, you know, you brought up the fact that he did, you know, act and direct in it. Do you, are you a fan of that? Are you a fan when the, the, the director is also the actor? Like, do you have any favorite movies that, you know, where that took place? Um, there's a couple movies that I actually like that came, uh, one that's actually right now doing well and streaming is um, A Quiet Place. Okay. The original Quiet Place, John Krasinski, yeah. Um. Actually, starred and directed in the movie with his wife, um, Emily Blunt. Yeah. So, that was a good example. I I like it when the actual actor that's in the movie has a passion for both in front or behind the camera. As you know, uh, John Krasinski was Jim from The Office. Yeah. And he cut his gums in The Office. He produced and actually directed a couple episodes for that. So I felt. You know, if you got the talent, I know there's some people that direct it and the movie goes off the rails, but when it's a movie that you have a tight budget and you have a vision, I'm all for it. Yeah. Now, do I want like Robert Downey Jr. uh directing like Avengers? No. <laughs> but if it's a if it's small indie if it's an indie film or a movie that that is grounded, yes. I mean, I mean, but but the yeah, but by the same token, I mean we had we have Ben Stiller. He directed Tropic Thunder, and that is top tier. That's comedy on an elite level, right there. Yeah, but you got to also understand, uh, Ben Stiller has been doing that for a lot of his hits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He 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 directs a whole bunch of stuff that he yeah. stars in because sometimes you know they see the vision. They, yeah. You know, another person that 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 does that that's out of the Ben Stiller universe is um, oh my God, I'm forgetting the guy's name. Uh, that he also 
produces the boys. Um, oh, I, I, Seth Rogen. I, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Seth directs and writes a lot of his stuff. Yeah, but you know, I mean, my for me, you know, my favorite director actor, and it's 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 he's leagues above everyone else. Jackie Chan. Well, people forget Jackie Chan did his own stunts. He directed the movies. He was in front of the camera like that man knew what he wanted and says, you know what? I'm going to do this myself. I'm going to do it, you know, efficiently. There's this story on uh, on Rush Hour 2 when they were filming in, in uh, Hong Kong and, you know, they were trying to get that shot over the over the ledge in the building when they get pushed off the top of the building and are holding on to the bamboo where yeah. like they had they were like, oh, we got to get a crane up there. We got to do all this. He's like, no, we don't need to do that. They just tied a rope around him his stuntman held the rope and he just leaned over and got the shot that's he's the man and funny yeah. thing was i thought you were gonna go about um the story which he didn't want to come back to rush hour yeah, yeah, yeah because he doesn't like big budget films in which he doesn't have any creative control yeah and i think the same thing happened with shanghai nights yeah like like you know he knew that it was gonna help him cross over even more he was already yeah. part of the side guys but he was going to be cemented with those, you know, American produced movies. But, you know, he's a person that likes to get um, his hands dirty. So, yeah, I don't know if you guys noticed he does, he hasn't had a lot of American films since then. He's been acting and putting out amazing movies. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, he, has, yeah he hasn't stepped because, I mean, you know, when he steps into like American movies, again, they, they some a lot of times they pigeonhole him. You know, they put him into the same kind of role like, you know, Tuxedo, which I like Tuxedo. I like the medallion, but you know, those are pretty much the same, you know, par for the chorus for what you see as Jackie Chan in an American movie. Yeah. I know he's like, he's just a fan of entertainment in general. So he would love to do more family movies and movies where he gets to play like, you know, uh, a dancer or a singer or something like that. Yeah. So, you know, I think he's just waiting for an American person to let him stretch his, his creativity and his range a little more. I mean, I know he does music. Yeah. Yeah, he's a big in karaoke too. I I want to see a movie. I'll be honest with you. I had this idea. And let me tell you. You tell me what you think. I had this idea. You know, you could you could do it with him and Chris Tucker, but like uh -huh. where you had Jackie. Uh, he owns a Chinese restaurant, right? Mm -hmm. And he's across the street from a black restaurant, like and, a soul food place. Yeah, and then they're kind of arguing about you know who's got like the better the better chicken wings and stuff like that. And it's yeah. a comedy. It's a family comedy. And then it turns out, you know, one of the buildings burns down or whatever, or maybe it's next door building burns down and they have to come together to try to like build a new restaurant and then go on like a road trip to like, you know, build the funds for this restaurant and then end yep. doing so they, you know, they work together, but it's just something that's not like action, but it allows him to, you know, play, put his, uh, his action talents behind something else. Yeah, I could, I could definitely get behind something like that. Yeah, yeah. Because a lot of times, you know, these actors, when they're put in a genre like like uh, Chris Tucker, you know, mm -hmm. people don't really cast him in dramatic roles. The, yeah. the dramatic roles that he's done has been, he's been casted by friends of his. Yeah. Um, And Jackie Chan, I guess, is the same way. Like, he he stars in a lot of dramas that, that have nothing to do with him fighting. You know what I mean? Like, um, like I, I get it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, hopefully, you know, somebody will give actors that actually have the skills to pull off other roles. Yeah. You know. Well, I mean, speaking of actors that were known for comedy and before jumping into something serious, that was Michael Keaton. You know, he was known yep. on TV for comedy before, you know, he got cast as Batman. So, you know, and, yep. you know, since how he started in this movie, this is another like kind of a departure for uh, someone like that, because a, a role like this has been, I would say, uh, you know, monopolized by uh, Liam Neeson over the last couple yep. of years, you know? But uh, before we get into the movie, as per usual on the podcast, Marcos, uh, what you drinking? Me? Uh, gonna be weird on the on the green screen, but this is Monster Green Tea. <laughs> uh, because I'm a weirdo. <laughs> I'm a weirdo. I pour it in a cup. Yes, this is the McDonald's adult Happy Meal cup. One of the six. Whoa, whoa, and whoa, I what, put it over ice. Cup? That's what's what gets. I can't huh? see the cup clearly. What's on the cup? Uh, what's on the cup right here is you got Grimace, a mug. You got the the McNugget kids or the McFried kids. You got the old 
1970s, 1980s, like little graphics and stuff. Yeah. So McDonald's put out this thing, which they call it the collector's meal. It's just a, a happy meal for adults. They they include these cups in for like a dollar more or two. What, what, you what, know, a, what's your go to McDonald's meal? Oh, man. It's always chicken nuggets, man. I'm really? sorry. I'm I'm a chicken nuggets guy, bro. I can't <sighs> like I don't know, man. I don't do burgers. I don't do chicken sandwiches when it comes to like McDonald's. I don't even do uh, a fish sandwich. Is nothing. It's always nuggets. What? But the fish sandwich they they have to make fresh. It's not. I just know. There. I know. But I, man, uh, it's, it's Big nuggets. Macs for me, bro. Big Macs for me, and but I mean at the same time a double cheeseburger is kick. Like it's just there's a specific flavor to that double cheeseburger. That you know you don't get on a burger anywhere else. As a matter of fact, the only time I've ever had that same flavor, which is kind of weird, is at Animal Kingdom in the, the Pandora area. They got the little yeah. like, it looks like a bow bun, but you bite into it, it tastes just like a double cheeseburger from McDonald's. Let me find out. We just we just uh, clued people in on on the secret there. Yeah. But yeah, I I could do a McDouble every right. now and then. Okay. Every now and then, but it's like it's a hankering. Then once I have it, I'm like, cool. I could I could go couple years without it all right well i'm i'm i gotta pull out my my oh with the, the fancy fridge over here uh oh i recently redid this whole setup and i put my fridge over here on the side but i got my little glass with the the globe ice because hold on. oh Six now i feel like a child out. you're drinking you're drinking like an adult Oh yeah, oh yeah, of course. Because you know, on the pod we uh, partake in some some things, and this week I will because you are the first uh, special guest host we've had on the pod. I'm gonna bring out something, some decent uh, whiskey. I got the uh, Buffalo Trace. Ah, I see so, you're a man of good taste. I like Buffalo Trace. I like yeah, yeah. I'm 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 a good I'm a big whiskey bourbon guy. Like I like that kind of stuff, especially if I'm drinking it like you know, on the rocks. Yep, you know, yep, yep. It is. It is what it is. You know. So, all right. So, off the top, did you like this movie? Oh, Actually, tell, tell, yeah, tell, yeah, yeah. I, we already. Told I like it. What I movie. like it. It was a good movie. It was a slow burn, but a good slow burn. It was one of those things that that when the movie opens up, I was kind of wondering where why they were showing certain scenes, but yeah. as the movie progressed, I'm like, oh, that explains everything. Yeah. And the good thing about it, it got straight to the point immediately. Yeah. And it, you saw it was like an overarching uh plot that you had to watch the whole movie to understand what, what was going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, for those who haven't watched the movie, uh go watch it now because we are gonna spoil it because that's what we yep. do on the pod. But yeah, I remember when I first started watching it, it definitely was slow. And as it was going, like you know, there's this there's this uh there's this storyline going throughout where Michael Keaton had actual uh uh the symptom or disease yeah. that's out there it's an aggressive form of dementia where when it happens just like yeah. in the movie it it's aggressive yeah, yeah so so when that was happening in the movie like i was watching and i was paying attention to the story and i was like oh man the story is actually really interesting but like it felt like the dementia part was kind of just thrown in there as like a little a little uh like quirk to his personality yep. but then you know, when it gets to the end, you're like, oh, oh, shit. No, no, no. This all this all tied together. Yep, everything comes comes together like a puzzle. Like, yeah. It was pretty it was pretty legit. Like, you, I like that it didn't lean too, too heavy on the action. Yeah, this was more of like you seeing the uh, the, uh, the world through the lens of Michael and understanding the relationships that he had. Yeah. Um, of course, as the lead character, John Knox. Who was also called Aristotle, which I thought it was cool, and he explained why and everything. Yeah. There was a lot of uh, actors in here that, honestly, if if you didn't if you didn't realize it, you would have missed. There was a lot of um, people playing awesome roles in it. Like, Bro, I, uh, when James Marsden showed up as his son, like I was looking at the I was looking at the the cast, and I was like, oh shit! Like if you had just if you had just put this on a poster and put it up at the theater. I'd be like, oh, this is going to be a great movie just based off of the cast list that they had. I mean, there is someone who shows up, you know, partway through seated in the chair. And I was like, I didn't expect him to be in this movie. Yeah, he uh, he definitely played a great role. It was a great use of him as an actor in the movie. Yeah. He wasn't chewing up scenery. He was needed for specific parts of the of the role. Yeah, it was really cool. 
Yeah, I mean, for those you know who haven't seen it, that we talk about Pacino, Pacino, uh, Scarface himself. He was he had he showed up in the movie, and I was like, he has this gravitas to his his to him that like when he gets into when he starts speaking, you kind of just got to sit down and listen. And you know, so when he plays an authority character or someone who's like you know pointing someone in the right direction, you almost got to sit there and be the character and listen to what he's saying. Yep, and it was cool. It looked like he had fun. He was chilling. Yeah, he, he had he had a whole dinner scene in a tub. Just <laughs> like, yo, can we shoot this in a tub? I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, that actually works. <laughs> like, all right, whatever, whatever you want, bro. Like, if you, <laughs> but if, okay, so if you had his character, like. And you could get away with some some character quirks. Like, what would is there something you would throw in there? Oh, bro, I would have sat there and like, I would have taken it to another level. I would have had a TV and uh, you know hanging from the wall of the tub or something. Yeah, and like you know, like if if you looked at the scene, his wife was like doing her her toes. <laughs> I would have like he was like he was chilling. I legit was like kind of jealous. I was like. Man, I should be in the tub just drinking some wine, chilling. Like you know, the guy was like, "It's four thirty. Yeah. He's like, "So, bro, he's like, he's like, I'm living my best life, bro." Like, I, if I if that was me, I'd have like had when Keaton walks in or Knox walks into the the room, I'd have been sitting there like putting together a Lego set, just something that shows like, hey, this guy who's this killer who runs all these killers, it's got some like you know whimsy to him to where he's like, okay, he don't take himself too seriously, but don't. That don't mean you got to, you know, sleep on him because clearly he's a dangerous guy. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And I like I like him and uh, Knox's relationship. Um, yeah. You can tell they were friends. So. So um, Pacino plays Xavier Crane, yep. who seems to be, you know, former assassin, former thief, which he keeps talking about that. Yeah. He's like, you know, I'm a thief, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah but yeah, like, yeah, you know, you're, 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 you don't trust me with your money. You know, I'm a thief, right? <laughs> yeah. So. They, they, I like that dynamic that they were chilling, and he ultimately, and as we see as the viewer, the plot, he facilitates, yeah, the final pieces, and it, it's crazy because the whole movie, if you think about what happened in the plot and and what Knox pulled off, yeah, with Michael Keaton's character, it's crazy that he did it while dealing with this, uh, this dementia, yeah, because it was brutal, like you said. The dementia at first felt like a novelty, but the way that they shot it and everything, yeah, and Michael Keaton's facial expression, and you know me having uh, experience with people in my family having dementia, it was spot on, man. Like, yeah, like, like, well, okay, it's like one of my favorite scenes, and it's very small. Is when he goes to the storage unit to to try to get his stuff to get the paintings, and he walks, he goes to the wrong storage unit. You know, yep. he walks up to the desk and he's just like, hey, like my key doesn't work. They're like, oh, the green ones are, that's out our other facility on Van Nuys. And he's just like, oh, hey, could you write down the, uh, what is it, the address? Like the yeah. way he reacted, it just, it felt like someone who's just trying to hold on to the not, or to the information in their head. Yeah. Something like that. And it, it just came across so naturally. I was like, oh man, this is actually really intrusive to the story because the story itself was so you know elaborate i mean for those okay again you guys haven't seen it yet okay so the the main story of the movie is key uh knox is an assassin and he's at a point in his life where he you know he's starting to develop this disease so he's trying to get out of the assassin game and in do and while he's doing that his uh i would venture to say his son who he's got a tumultuous relationship with shows up at his house bleeding and turns out he you know murdered someone after that yep. person kind of did some shit to his daughter so Knox is tasked with helping him clean that up while also setting his affairs right and it kind of just that all intertwines really yep. expertly it's it's insane i i loved it i loved it for what it was yeah. um like you, like you alluded to, like the the way that that they the dialogue and everything was put together. Like this is not an Oscar worthy movie, but it was a really good movie. Yeah. Like when when he was talking to Xavier, who who what I like is that they never showed you who Jericho was, which was Knox's boss. Yeah. Like the head guy, but he talked to Xavier and he was like, "Man, I I he killed his partner Muncie." Yeah. And he was like, I don't even remember doing it. I know I did it because, like, 
even when they showed it, he's like, you could tell he's like, oh shit, what? Yeah, like yeah. he had to figure out what happened without yeah. him knowing what happened. Like, mm-hmm. and it, the fact so- that he was he was able to like at least delay the investigation the way he staged the scene was genius. Yeah, like, yeah. I actually thought they were gonna possibly pull a, a usual suspects where like you know they have the dementia and it's in there, but like by the end of the movie, it was almost just like a MacGuffin. Like it actually. He actually wasn't developing dementia or anything like that. Like he was mm-hmm. actually just, you know, on the straight and narrow the entire time. But the fact that they kept that and not only did they keep it, it he used it in his favor to set himself up to live a more comfortable life later. Yeah. I thought it was dope. You yep. know? It was it was really cool. Um, I like that his partner, like immediately, like, you know, we've had coworkers that, you know, I know with your line of work, I know my line of work, we tend to work with with people on a day-to-day basis that we come to know and love and care for. Yep. That um he his partner knew immediately something was up. Yeah. And it went to like, the wrong car. Yeah. And that like the fact that like you know what I mean? Like only people that you're cool with would know what car you drive. Yeah. He's like, hey, you or like a car? And he was like, oh, oh shit, my yeah. bad. Wrong car. And he was like, yeah. <laughs> It's, but it, I feel like it's little quirks, it's little things like that, touches like that, that like really build the, the relationships between characters in movies. Because, you know, you can tell, you know, react however they want. Like when they pull in, when he goes into the diner, yeah, and he goes, he says, hey, you know, uh, you know, those things, newspapers, you know, those things come on your phone now, right? And yeah. He goes, and he was like, like ah, has 10,000 books. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was, it was fun. I like that. I like that he came back and they went on the job and I think it fit the story that you didn't have like Muncie, um, his partner who died in uh, towards the beginning of the movie, wasn't like, it wasn't like a crazy death. It wasn't like they shot at each other. Yeah. It was kind of like he walked in and then like, and you could see in his eyes as he was passing away that he was like, why did he do that? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. It wasn't like, like, oh, a betrayal yeah, it was is coming. It was literally just like a, oh shit moment. Like, dude, what the fuck? Like, this is, this wasn't supposed to happen like yeah well what you doing and he and and Knox is sitting there just trying to he's trying to piece it together like oh shit like i just shot my friend like what the hell yeah it, it was cool so reading the the production notes here um michael keaton also produced this movie this man really wanted this movie to get done which i love yeah so well i feel like i feel like for people like him you know you you get older in years we were talking about earlier how some actors can get pigeonholed into to you know or stay um can get typecast into certain roles and like sometimes you just got to put your money where your mouth is when you want to you know stretch your range you know yeah. sometimes you got to be the guy that puts everything together because you want to play this character that other people can't really see you playing you know yeah and sometimes it's just i feel like sometimes it's just it's a story like you just interested in like telling, you know, like those those adult uh, crime dramas where there's not really much humor to them. Like you don't really get a lot of those movies anymore in theaters. Like you'll see them in streaming, but nowadays, like you just they they kind of fly by night. You you see them pop up every now and then, but by and large, they don't really make them that much anymore. And also, they're typically not that good. This one yeah. I enjoyed. I'm glad yeah. I watched this. What's- like. Oh, like, oh, oh, oh. what's what's one that you would consider not that good? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> okay, one that I would consider not that good. Like, okay, you mentioned him, Liam Nielsen. I love Liam Nielsen. Yep. I I I rocked with him with uh, Taken One. I rocked with him Taken Two. Yeah. Taken Three. I was kind of like, all right, what are we doing here? Yeah. And then he came up with a couple movies where he played a uh, a guy that that lived on a farm. Mm-hmm. That that kind of like saw somebody uh get human traffic, and then all of a sudden he felt the need to like jump in, like. <laughs> and I watched the movie, and I was just like, I want my hour and a half back. <laughs> and like, it was like, like what the hell is this? And it's like, it's like if the movie was written as a comedy, I'll be like, okay, this is cool. But it wasn't. It was supposed to be like an action movie, and I'm pulling up the name right now because I was just it like, it wasn't nonstop, was it? 
Nonstop no. was when he was on the train. Yes, nonstop well, was, like, was the one when he was on the train. Yeah, like I like Neam Nielsen, but it was where is it? Yeah. Oh, I. I, I wonder. Oh, the marksman. Okay, okay. I, I've heard of that. I've heard that name of a movie, but I haven't I haven't seen it. It was but, it was so convoluted. He was a former U.S. Marine Corps sniper and Vietnam vet, and he had a dog. And like his his ranch was on the border of Mexico and Texas or whatever. Yeah. And some some kid and their mom came in. The mom got killed by some drug dealers or coyotes. Yeah. Know the which are the people that traffic people back and forth on the border. Yeah. And he all of a sudden, like, just like, all right, kid, I'm gonna go. A kid that doesn't know him, he's like, I'm gonna help you get to the States. <laughs> After him being like anti-immigrant in the beginning of the movie. <laughs> and it's like <laughs> and he's a rancher. Like he gets these roles where he's a naturally speaking English with an accent. It's yeah. like, oh, I'm an American cowboy. That just happens to be Hella Scottish for no reason. <laughs> oh shit! And you know who go? You know who that happens to a lot is. I mean, those like those roles where it just they kind of just you know are the same character just in different occupations, or whatever. Like is like Jason Statham. Jason Statham gets those roles where he's like the the under under the the radar like tough guy. But Jason Statham though. He he chews up a lot of scenery in a good way, and he yeah. always brings his his magic to the movies. Like yeah. there's one movie that I want you to watch that I know the rule is to only do podcasts on movies that we you haven't seen. Yeah. But Wrath of Man is probably Jason Statham's best role that I've seen him in in his later years. Really? Like I, yeah. So I, have, so I know a lady who worked on that movie and i i want to i venture to say she might have been his his acting coach on that movie i'll have to double check but that always you know i mean, I remember hearing about that movie but it just felt like another you know war or another um what is it the mechanic no this is it's like i'm i don't want to give you spoilers like his character is the, you it starts off you thinking it's a typical jason statham but yeah. at at the heart of the role is something that's very relatable as a person that loves somebody, what lengths you yeah. would go to, to seek revenge. That's why the movie is perfectly titled Wrath of Man. Yeah. And it's typically when him and Guy Ritchie, it, in the beginning of their run together yeah. as actor and director, they were amazing. Some in the middle were not great. Yeah, yeah, but this one was their return to form. So, so that's but, so it's a Guy Ritchie movie. Yep. Okay, I didn't know that. Okay, because I mean, I like you know, you know, I miss Jason Statham in the in the snatches in the in the Lock, Stock, and Two Smoke Camaros. I one of my favorite Jason Statham movies is The Italian Job, just because yep. he got to play a comedic. You know, he's a tough guy, but just, you know, the comedic side of him. He didn't need to, you know, be the guy that, you know, fucked everything up, you know? Yep. Yeah. But in the Rafa Man, there's a lot of good characters. You got Josh Hartnett. You got uh, Scott Eastwood. Yeah. You got, um, if you have, if you ever seen Burn Notice, you got the guy from Burn Notice, Michael Wesson, yeah. Yeah, yeah. who's an amazing actor himself. It's a movie. It's like, I don't want to ruin it and give it too much. You got to watch it. Yeah. The yeah. movie. I believe is in three parts. Yeah. Like, you know how movies come in and they'll be like, chat. like, you know how Knox has said week one, week two. Yeah, yeah. That's how the movie is broken up, but it's Guy Ritchie, but it's not the typical, you know, like everybody heavy accents and people, yeah. you know, doing crazy things in between. It's a really good drama yeah. full of action that you're like, oh man. And Jason St Staten looks scary in that movie, bro. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to check it out. You know, speaking of uh, speaking of like good actors and movies, you know, in this film, we did have James Mars then show up as Knox's son. Now, let me ask you a question: If you have an estranged son, right? Uh, clearly, they something happened with them, which we find out in the movie. Um, what do you do if that dude shows up on your doorstep bleeding, asking for help? Like, do you do you hear him out? Well, you know. I hate to be that guy 
I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> is this Hispanic. the New York in you? Is this the New York Hispanic in you that's about to talk? <laughs> yeah, the New York Hispanic in me that's about to talk. Um, for those of you who don't know Dominican culture, I am Dominican. We, family is everything. Yeah. Whether we don't speak for 30 years or if we speak in every day. So regardless, if I have an estranged son, somebody is my flesh and blood and comes to me yeah. and needs help and I'm in the position to do it, yeah, I will do it. So I completely, you know, I'm I'm not a parent, but I completely understand even with his entire universe imploding of Michael yeah. Keaton's character, John Knox, with the dementia and him trying to leave the uh, the game of uh, assassination he immediately was like i'm in like yeah. you know what i mean he, he and like the way he did it so nonchalantly it like surprised james marson's character which was um miles yeah yeah, yeah. so like when he asked him did did you bury him he's like wait wait what he goes, did you bury him he goes no like like why he goes oh because if you did i was gonna dig him up and kill him again myself <laughs> yeah I was like, oh, yeah shit. towards the end but you know what was crazy the dialogue that they had when them two spoke yeah remember uh, in the diner scene and this is later on in the film yeah. when they when they're discussing the plan and everything and he's telling him how to proceed they're having a conversation where james marsden or miles and knox was trying to like rationalized why they weren't close he was and then he kept saying stuff that uh john knox kept correcting him on he was like yeah i can never kill anybody like you do and then like john knox or mike king's character would be like well you did yeah and you are a killer yeah, yeah. and like kind of giving him the reality of the situation yeah yeah, yeah. You're, you're like you're more like me than you want to you, you want to believe yeah, he's like, I. that's why I didn't want you in my life because I was afraid of how I was going to turn out. And then he said a line that gave me chills that was probably a throwaway line, but I it, it hit for me was when he was like, yeah, you wanted to, but yet we're here. Yeah, yeah. Like, basically, no matter how far, you know, you ended up being exactly like me. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether and you like it or not, they're both two killers in the room right there yeah. you know what i mean like, okay so but in, in like in, in in life do you think that's do you think that's a product of like everyday life where like you know no matter how much you try to distance yourself from your parents or the childhood you grew up in like you have people have a tendency to to become like their parents whether they want to or not i so we're basically talking about nature versus nurture yeah I do think that it has both are have a lot to do with your personality, mm -hmm. but if one outweighs the other, which I think uh nurture, yeah, you can you can defy you can evade what your natural instincts or what your DNA you're predisposed to to be. Yeah. Like for example, if you know if our great granddads and you know i don't want to speak ill of any dead people if our great granddads were killers yeah. it doesn't mean that we were going to be killers yeah because you know we didn't grow up in their situation we didn't we didn't live their lives like i i personally think that the kids that are born now are going to have an easier life than for example me and you who are in our 40s yeah because you know like right now you know if they wanted to find something or information is so readily available and society is a lot easier to live in nowadays yeah. than it was yeah. when we were kids. So I think to answer your question is, I don't believe that just because you were born from somebody that acted a certain way that you were going to be the certain way. Yeah. However, there are biological connections to certain things yeah. that I think we can't break. Like, if if your dad was born with a mental defect where he had no empathy you can inherit that like yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. i mean yeah where you don't care about human life like that like so yeah. i understand that but the way that they portrayed john knox was he did this because he was good and yeah. it, and if you notice in xavier uh him and xavier talk which is al pacino's they talked about how the the reason he was recruited because he was so smart yeah and because of how good he was doing everything so yeah yeah, yeah. I, and i think you know you know like again you got uh, miles character who didn't want to be like his dad like you know just held 
I don't know, they didn't really delve into like the childhood aspect of it, but clearly there was animosity built there. And so he didn't want to be like his dad, but in, in trying to protect his family, ends up becoming just like his dad. So I always think that, you know, that again, the whole nature versus nurture thing, I think sometimes those things that we inherit from our parents, you know, always bubble up just in different situations. You know, like it, they, they come to fruition in, in ways like, so my dad, my dad, uh, you know, his work ethic, you know, he was very blue collar and very, uh, uh, you know, if I, if I can use my hands to put this together, then I can make something come, come to fruition. And so when I was growing up, you know, he worked in a factory, you know, 10 hours, eight, 10 hours a day, then he would leave there and then go cut lawns for another six hours a day. And he did that for years. And so me, I look at my dad like, I'm just not that guy who's doing like that manual labor thing like that. That's not, you know, my forte. But then I go and do wrestling costumes and I make this stuff. And the one thing I notice is my work ethic when it comes to that is exactly the same as my dad's work ethic when it comes to what he was doing. So, you know, it's like, okay, I'm not like my dad, but I'm exactly like my dad in that aspect. Yeah, I I could definitely relate. Like my dad was an auto body mechanic. Yeah, uh, had paint shops and everything like that. Very meticulous, you know, like, you know, worked yeah. 15 hour days sometimes, you know. And although I despise manual labor, I have a work ethic of an immigrant, even though I'm, <laughs> like, like I can work two jobs and chill. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know what it is. Like, I know people that are like, oh, I got to go in for a four hour shift. And I'm like, bro, what are you talking about? Like, yeah. like I'm a person, if I need to work 15 hours a day, I will do it. And I wouldn't complain about it because that's just how I am. Like, you know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, some some people can't work four hours without looking at the clock and being like, yo, I got to be out of here soon. Whereas me, it's like, I used to work in a sneaker store. I'd work, you know, 15 hour days wearing, you know, Chuck Taylor's. And I'm like, yep. yeah, my feet don't hurt. I'm good. Like, th- if this is what I got to do right now, this is what I'm doing. Like, it's not. Exactly. It's like, not. It's, I, I made the choice to then be here and do this. So I'm not going to sit here and complain about it. It's just, this is what I'm doing. So let's fucking do it. Like, when I was younger, um, like, I, I worked retail, too. And it was like, all my friends used to be, like, the first in line. When people were like, oh, who wants to go home? They'd be like, me. I'd be like, no, nah, I'm good, bro. Like, I'll stay extra if you need me. Like, yeah. Like I, I do, bro. I remember one time I was working at the ice cream factory, and like it was just a particularly busy summer. So like I would get done with my, you know, my shift. Well, I used to work overnights, uh, ten thirty at night to seven in the morning. But then like my my dad, he worked at the same factory. His department needed help, so I would stay and work till noon, and like I would do that every day. And then on the weekends, I'd work, you know, double time, triple time, all this stuff. And I'm like. No, like if the time is there and I don't got nothing else to do, like fuck it, I might as well go make some money. That's just yep. that's just how I was built. The same here, man. I I remember like in my job, like in in, in the the gig that I work now, I'm assistant engineer. But when I was part of the help desk, yeah, like the help desk used to, uh, still opens weekends. I would be like, I will work every day. Yeah, and I remember they used to have a person that was just hired to work weekends, and they got really sick. And nobody wanted to cover. I was working seven days a week and laughing to the bank because it, to me it was easy work. I'm like, bro, I'm not out here lifting bricks and building houses. Like this is computer stuff. Like, sorry, that was that was the computer doing computer things. It's all good. It didn't even um. I I heard you more than I heard <laughs> the computer, but it's it's like man, I love it. I like I I, I, I got the hustle with me, man. All right, so but, but so, so speaking of occupations, could you be a hired killer like John Knox? Man, listen, I don't know, and this is gonna I don't want to come off as a sociopath or anything <laughs> like that, but I find these movies fascinating. <laughs> like the lifestyle, I love everything except the killing. Like the fact that they rolled up and they're like so ingenious and they're so calm and cool and collective. And they always got they always strapped up or like it's something like cool. It's never like like it, they they romanticize these positions and these occupations. Yeah, that are really not like that in real life. I'm pretty sure that there are professional hitmen 
that do live the life that uh, Michael Keaton's character John Knox had. Yeah. But it's not that sophisticated. It's just a goon with a gun yeah. that just shoots people. Yeah. Some they, dude in a some dude in a windbreaker outfit. Yeah. Comes like, up on you in a pair of New Balances and just shot and then walks off. You know. Yeah. Like it's not like a guy for like like oh I cleaned up the scene. You know what I mean? Ain't no guy with two PhDs doing this, but like, <laughs> like, like it, they make it seem cool, man. Like that, yeah. and like, um, like the the wet work that uh, you know we talked about Liam Nielsen, like his character in Taken. Yeah, like you know what I mean? Like people that actually are these quote unquote fantasy people that we like. You know, if somebody is like a secret agent yeah. that has a crazy life. A lot of this stuff is just investigation. Like these yeah. field agents are not out there, you know, putting people to sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're more they, it, they do. They're more Columbo than they are Jason Bourne. Yeah. It's just somebody goes out there and just detective work, but they're not again, like I I part of me hopes there's someone out there that is the next, you know, you know, Jason Bourne, just high level killer that like, okay, when when this doesn't work, we send in the Navy SEALs. When that doesn't work, we send him in. And he's going to take the person out on his own. It's like, well, then like, why didn't you send him in the first place? Like, I don't know. Like, I, I really hope. Like, yeah. I don't. Like, and you know, in a different universe, if I was president, that will be the that will be the first question I ask. Like, I, right, who's our guy? <laughs> what do you mean? Like, who's the guy that we could send? Like, you know. <laughs> I want to look. Like, hey, what was your background, bro? Did, where did you grow up? Did you grow up in Queens? Like, I would want to sit and talk. Like, can you hang out with me for a weekend? Oh. Like, like bro, do you do stuff like this? Do you, like, paraglide off of the side of a cliff? Like, you know, who's the 007 here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's the who's the Ethan Hunt that's like, okay, I'm just as comfortable in a nightclub setting as I am, you know, running down the side of the Burj Khalifa. Like, come on. Yeah, that's a, that's a crazy thing is, like, like, when you talk about a character like Ethan Hunt. Yeah. Like, that can't be one person. Yeah. Like can't you be. can't have a person that's so invisible that'll get that and they're so focused and then it'll be charismatic at the same time because those yeah. personalities, they clash. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, if, if you if you're good enough to climb a building with no ropes, with just your bare hands, you're not the guy who can talk up a girl at a club. I'm sorry. Yeah. That yeah. ain't the same. You're not gonna dude. be like, what's up, girl? Like <laughs> Oh shit! All right, so all uh, right, so uh, okay, but so by the end of the movie, you know, Knox is you see the whole plan coming together. Now, at one point in the movie, you see Knox taking all of the uh, the evidence from the murder scene and planting it in his son's apartment. And I was yep. wondering what the fuck was going on because I'm in my head, I'm like, oh, like he's either he's forgetting where he's doing it or something something's going on that I'm not paying attention to. I. I kind of like got a little bit like I I didn't think it was what we were seeing in face value. Yeah. What worried me is what he was doing with the things that he was using. Oh, like putting like stuff the, in the freezer, uh, like, the, like the turkey baster. Yeah. Uh, the gloves, like he just threw them in a bag and left them on there, and I was like, that's gonna come back to haunt him. Yeah. But then he fooled all of us. Yeah. yeah. It was all part of the plan. Yeah, he was like, I'm going to set everything up so that, like, one, one, I'm going to set it up so that my son kind of gets in trouble but doesn't get in trouble just so he knows, hey, I owe you this because you turned me in for some tax shit years ago. Yeah, like, I, I owe you some revenge on that, but I'm not going to leave you there yeah. for the rest of your life. But think about the genius. And this is why I think them mentioning the history and English PhDs that he had yep. was key is that he knew that if he set it up right, the state or whoever is investigating him will never come back to the sun. Yep. And um, he'll set himself up and he's already like, like, you know, spoiler alert. He knew he was going to go to jail because he fucked up that, uh, that first scene in the, in the, in the, in the, in the movie, the first killing. There was yeah, no yeah. way for him to get out of that. And he was smart enough then to know that it was only a matter of time. Instead yeah. of him running, he's like, you know what? Screw it. I'm probably ne not going to remember any of this. I'm going to take care of uh, two birds with one stone. Yeah. And that was genius. The way that they wrapped it up 
And even people are like, oh, it was it might have been like, oh, it's a MacGuffin. It wasn't like the fact that he knew what to do yep. to show that and that anybody with any forensic degree would be like, no, this is kind of too perfect. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like even down to the single hair that was on the jacket, they were like, how does he get one single hair on a jacket? Yeah. <laughs> and no other hair. Yeah, exactly. You know, what was interesting is that, um, you know, how, what, what, fuck, I, did, I, did I just lose my train of thought? God damn it. I think I lost my train of thought. While you gather that, what you thought about the household uh, things that he used to, like, collect the evidence from the the second crime scene, from the the crime of passion that his son committed? Like, hmm. like the whole, what was it, spices and all that yeah, stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he was mixing it all in, things like that, to so yeah. that it it kind of like tainted all the evidence just enough to where it, people go, okay, like, you know, it, it frees his son up in a way that they're like, okay, it's like, it, it wasn't him, but it let his son know like, Hey, like I can do this to you whenever I want. So like, you know, just be, be mindful, like be, be, res- be, be a respectful son. And then he actually cleaned the clothes that his son was wearing. Yeah. And then put, the tainted blood on top of the exact stains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that way, no matter what, they're not going to know that it that it was from the like. He basically was like, "Here's the actual evidence." Yeah. But I altered it to the point that you know that this can't be the original evidence, and it looks like you know what yeah. I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like that was pure genius. Um, the only, the only, the only kismet that I got of this particular movie, or my my one judgment is I felt like the whole thing about the guy was part of the Aryan nation either was tossed in yeah, or it might've been something that was left on the cutting room floor because that came out of nowhere. Like they yeah. could have just left the guy as a perv. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, the, yeah. But the fact that, that it was like, Oh yeah, he's the Aryan brotherhood. I was like, okay. Like, so, okay. So here's something about the movie that I, it, it kind of, it didn't irk me, but it was, it felt like it was just tossed in there for like, the, the detective lady's personality, when she was talking about like the stuff with her mom and stuff like that, like in the initial, when you initially meet her and she talks about her past and uh, you know, the way her mom was, it, you know, it taught her to, to pay attention to the details, you know, and when she talks about how there's water on the floor. So that means the shower was running when it was, sure. when the, everything happened, who turned off the shower, but like throughout the movie, the way her personality was, I was like, I think they're making her an asshole for just no reason. I felt like she came off a bit obsessive. Yeah. Like but it was, but it wasn't, it, it was almost obsessive in a sense where like, Oh, I've been trying to catch some guy that's been doing this for forever, but yeah. you never really got that sense. You just kind of got like this lady, she's kind of got an attitude and she's got a quip for everything, you know? Oh yeah. You know, it's always guys with you. And then they are doing the joke later, but it was like, it just felt like it was forced. I don't want this character to I, just be a, a detective. I hope that it was something that was left on the cutting room floor. Yeah. Like the whole thing about uh the cancer or treatment or something with uh yeah. with her kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as I'm thinking about it now, I'm getting an epiphany that it it kind of understands uh a lens to her understanding the situation that Miles uh John Knox's son was put in. Yep. Kind of knowing and piecing together the doctor that uh John Knox went to in the beginning yeah. of the movie. Yeah, the neurologist. Like, I could kind of feel like the detective having some understanding of going to that process because it, from what we saw, it looks like she went to something similar for her child. Yeah. But uh yeah, I felt like that was somewhere that the writing was on the cutting room floor. Yeah. Now I now one thing that we haven't mentioned was the whole Annie situation? Or oh, the the, the hooker? Yeah, talk yeah. about you just being impatient. But and he, like he tells her, "Hey, yep. you're the third person yeah. and that I'm giving them I'm setting my money up for." And then like her or like it wasn't a or something that upset me in the plot. It's something that upset me with her character when cuz he said earlier it's like three people and he said to her in and when he was talking about cashing out yeah. That you're you're getting some money. Yeah. 
and she immediately took it. She's like, oh, you're confusing me for your wife. Yeah. But it's like, no, he's not. Like, you know what I mean? Like, come yeah. on now. Like, but, but he also said, you know, you know, when she, okay, so when she came there with the guys to rob him, like she says, you know, that's a lot of money, John. Like, so in that sense, I was like, okay, maybe she, maybe she knew she was getting money, but then she was like, okay, I can get some more money. But so, but so when she brought up the whole, you know, you confused me with your your ex wife. I was like, but did like did she think that way, or did she just think like, okay, maybe I can rob him and get more money? But then he made a good point. He was like, well, how are you guys gonna split it? You know, because if you split it, that four was ways, key. Yeah, you split it four ways. Like, but you were gonna get a third. Yeah. And then he held up the gun, and then it it cut. It goes to black. So you're like, did he shoot her? Like, yeah, I almost we got him. we got that we got that uh answer at the end of the movie. Uh, if you're still listening to us and you haven't watched it, yeah, spoiler alert, yeah, two people get the money. His son, his ex-wife, she gets she gets all the books. <laughs> she gets the books <laughs> and gets to keep her life and yeah. maybe change it. Yeah, 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 I was the only, I like to look too deep into stuff. Is it me or she's doing really well for somebody that's a hooker? Yeah, I saw, I saw her house. I was like, man, that's a nice. Yeah, house. Like, she got a yard and everything. <laughs> like she got a nook. She got a nook. Put those books in. I do like the fact I like I like the fact that they never gave us amounts, but I do love that his ex wife was like, oh, oh like when yeah. she saw when she saw how much money. <laughs> well, because because they had that conversation about like she was like you know I I don't want the money. And he was like he was let's let's skip over this part of the conversation where you say you don't want the money and then I convince you to take it, yeah. and then you cut to that where she's just like. That's how that that accentuates how much money it is because it's like yep. this lady who says she didn't want the money looked at I was like God damn I'm glad I still got this money yeah and then I like the son's reaction the son like paused he was like like that like I wish there was like <laughs> I wish movies came with like a thirty minute feature afterwards that you yeah. dive into what happened yeah like he must have so much grief like you saw how he cried when he went to visit him yeah. Um, like the fact that it's like even after that, now his dad is like lost in his mind, and he took care of his him. He basically doesn't have to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the crazy thing is, I love the little things that they do. Going back to um, the whole situation when Cheryl, the daughter, sixteen yeah. years old, they accentuated the innocence when she was at the abortion clinic and put the little, little hearts on her eyes, and I was yeah. like. I was like, man, she's a little girl. Yeah, and okay. all I kept thinking was like all that therapy that she's going to need because she's going to eventually find out what happened. Well, that's the thing, yeah, because she was reacting like, uh, I, clearly they didn't tell her that the dude got killed, you know? But like, I was sitting there when I was watching, I was like, man, she's re she's reacting very like, you know, upbeat for someone who, you know, just had an abortion and whose baby daddy just got killed. <laughs> man. Yeah. That whole... And then, like, they accentuated, like, the little girl purse that she was carrying. Like. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know. I, it's, I feel for the Miles character because if, if someone like that impregnates my daughter, you know, clearly who's a pedophile, who's, who's you know, who's praying. Sorry, the, younger... the daughter's name is Kaylee. Yeah. Cheryl is um, Miles' wife. Yeah. I just want to correct that. I don't want people to be like, man, this guy doesn't pay hey, attention. Listen. Listen, there's a, there's a, if you look at the description of the podcast on YouTube or any, or on our Instagram page, you'll, you'll see that it literally says we're just two dumb dudes talking about movies in life. So it's, it's all good, <laughs> but no, so like, wait, hold on. He never said if he liked the movie. Oh, I love the movie. I thought okay. it was great. I mean, good, you know, the good. conversation went, but I thought it was great Ooh, because I thought God. it was great in a sense that like it, it, it was one of those movies where when I'm watching it, I'm like, this is a good movie, but there's, there's parts of it, the dementia and all those things that kind of felt like they were just tacked on just to be, um, you know, just little nuances to character that don't really mean much to the story. But then by the end, when it all ties together and you see how he worked everybody and got everyone, you know, he took care of people while teaching people lessons before his brain really disappeared. And I was like, man, like this, it, it, it tied in so well that I was like, God damn, like it was, he's, I don't know. I don't want to call no him a loose fucking end. mastermind. No yeah. loose ends. Yeah, there isn't. There really like, isn't you know any loose like, like, and then him staring out the window at the end, 
and like the facial expression. Like he has no idea where he's at. He doesn't know who he is. Yeah. He's just like, you know, everybody's life goes on. And like it, it, it's a, a movie like this kind of reminded me of you ever seen a beautiful mind? Yep. Yeah, it kind of reminded me of that, where it's someone who's so smart in what they do that like they're operating at a level that everyone around them just doesn't really understand. Yep. You know? And then for this one, you know, as his mind is disappearing, the one thing he's still holding on to is his skills. Because, like, you get this, his dude going through dementia, doesn't know, like, how to react, can't even remember his, his, la his middle name. He had to look it up on his license and said it was Walker and not Henry. But then when dudes show up at his house ready to kill him, that Instincts. muscle memory popped in, was beating dudes up with a neurology book. I was like, God damn. Yo, when he, when he, I, it was funny because, like, I was like, these guys are the worst set of men there. Yeah. Like, like the fact that he knew instinctually where his, his gun is, like, in the, mm -hmm. in the linen closet, and then he saw it was missing. He was like, all right. He, like, he, he probably didn't know exactly what was going on, but he was like, all right, it's time to turn on danger mode. Like, I gotta, yeah. What did, what did you think was happening at that time? I knew something what was gonna happen. Like no, I no, felt no, like, no, but wait, like but I didn't, what I didn't, did you think was happening? I honestly, I thought that uh that guy Jericho was sending was sending somebody to like kill him. So there's no loose ends about their operation or anything because that was the only person that we never heard from in the entire movie. Yeah, I I personally I thought it might have been Miles got out of jail after realizing his dad set him up Ooh. and was gonna. That would have been cool. Yeah, yeah, but then he would have he would have been at a disadvantage. He would have Miles would have been dead. Yeah, yeah, if Miles would have pulled up with a gun, like if uh, he hesitated for a second yeah. and Knox didn't recognize who he was, he it, it would have been detrimental for his son. Okay. It would have uh, killed. And now I just remembered what what escaped my mind earlier. So when they kept talking about you know just say the word, you do this last part, and then I'll make the call. What did you think that call was? I at that point when they had the conversation, I knew he was going to call the police. Why? Like, what, what? What gave it away for you? What gave it away is because he made sure that he was at home, and he basically, I think that was his, that was the fail safe, and the fact that that Knox was not cleaning up the bodies. Yeah. Like, I think at that point Knox was like, "All right, I did what I needed to do as far as I can do." Yeah. Like I didn't realize that how elaborate the phone call was. Yeah. Like there was a couple things that that kind of like I felt like they should have addressed or have an, a little scene. Yeah. Was the cops are not going to realize that he was calling this other the Xavier this entire time on his mm -hmm. phone. Yeah. Like they should he should have walked him through on how to delete the phone records or whatever or something yeah. or have Knox like toss the phone or break it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, also not, Michael Keaton shines, bro. Yeah, he's so movie. good in this movie. He's when so when they came to his house to question him, he was like, "Oh, all right, cool, guys." Like yeah. <laughs> I've never seen somebody so upbeat to get pulled into the, a precinct ever in my life. Right? He was like, he was like, "So you, you guys can go and I'll follow you." They're like, oh, "How about we follow you?" He goes, oh yeah, you know what? Yeah, obviously. Yeah, that's yeah. smart. He's like, "I'll get a, I'll get a jacket." Like my man was like. like all right, all right. So before we go, uh, Marcos, I want to know like, wh what what role did movies play in your life? Like, clearly, for the people that are gonna that, that that I pull in as special guests here, we all have a love for movies. Like, what is it about movies in your life that like attract you to you know to cinema? Well, you know, as I'm gonna use a term that maybe your audience doesn't understand, I was a latchkey kid. Okay. For those of you who don't know, a latchkey kid is a kid that normally goes home, let lets himself in, and their parents are later on are either at work or whatever. When I was a little bit older, my mom uh, was a stay at home mom after a while, but I used to um I always I'm the youngest of four siblings. Yeah. And my older brothers and my dad used to always watch movies. Mm -hmm. So as a kid of the '80s. I used to sit in front of in front of the TV and watch it with them. So my first love was wrestling, was action movies like Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, you know, Steve, uh, what's it called, Sly Stallone, you know, all these movies. And 
it brings like the best way I can describe it is it reminds me of those times where everything was simple and it's like a form of escapism. Yeah. I guess like I, I'm, I am a huge consumer of media. I love movies. Like I have a server full of movies that I legally own. (laughs) uh, That I make digital (laughs) copies for myself. Just want to put that out there. Yeah. Um, that I go back and watch because it's like, it's like, I love movies and I love reading books. Yeah. Because it takes you to a world that, you know, that is different from ours, whether it's one based in reality or something based in fantasy, like the Marvel movies. Yeah. And I always like seeing what other people um, interpret those worlds to be like fun fact that I don't think I've ever revealed. I love watching book. Uh, I'm sorry. What? reading books that later get to be movies because I always like seeing how others interpret how I interpreted something. Okay. Well, let, me ask you a question. let me ask you a question with that. Cause I have my own take on that kind of stuff. Do you prefer watching the movie after reading the book or do you prefer reading the book after watching the movie? Uh, the first part, reading the book and then watching the movie. Hmm. Okay, the okay, reason okay. being is because okay. my mind is very complex. Okay. Like I like I like coming up with how I think the characters look based on the description. And I like seeing yeah. um like what the uh the studio, whoever produces the content, yeah, brings that character to life. Okay. Now, I'm not gonna say that that's always a struggle. I have watched movies and then gone back and read the books. Yeah. Like, you know, um, Lord of the Rings. I remember I I read the first book, but I watched all the movies uh, when they released. And then I found myself going back and rereading the whole series, including the movie, the books that I didn't uh, read, which was the, the Two Towers. Yeah, yeah. Was, I believe the second book. Yeah, yeah. I didn't I didn't read that one. But when I saw the movie, I was like, oh, man, I got to reread all of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it's cool. So. It, I just I find that, you know, whenever I watched a movie after after reading the book, I've always found myself a little disappointed because I I would look at it and be like, oh man, they left this part out, they left this part out, oh they changed this. But if I watched the movie then read the book, I almost felt like I could appreciate both because like it was almost like an expansion pack. You know, you watch the movie, then you yeah. read the book and it's an, and it's it's an expansion pack on the story you were already told. So I was like, "Oh, okay. Now I have this in-depth, you know, look into the story versus, you know, what I watch in the movies." Cuz like, you know, like for instance, uh Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, like it's such a dense book and they had to cut out so much like the whole the whole storyline with the house elves and all that. So yeah. like if I if I'm watching that movie after reading the book, I get disappointed because some of those some of those are my favorite parts. Just a little part where like uh, where uh, Dobby is working in you know Hogwarts then, mm-hmm. but like if I watch the movie first and then I read it, I'm like oh shit like that's cool. I w- I wish they had put that in the movie, but it didn't taint my my viewing experience. I'm it's funny because like me and a couple buddies of mine. Um... Yeah, we had this podcast uh, called the the Retreon Podcast, and basically we talk about media, we talk about movies, we talk about comics, and there was a stigma on me that I always give everything a chance. Yeah, like you know what same. I mean. I'm like, the same. I'm the same exact way. Like I, there's people out there that if a movie comes out and it is not exactly how a comic or the book behind it. Yep. They trash the movie. My thing in it, I have this understanding, like, how about you consume it and you decide whether the movie itself was good? Yeah. Not if it was a a, a word for word adaptation of what you expected. Yeah. Like, so like if you, you want know, that, like, if you want that, the comic is right there. Go read it. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like a lot of people are not gonna get the nuances. I love when movies do fan service. Um, but I also like that you know a director or somebody that's producing it is allowed to explore uh the creative freedom yes there is a guideline that's there yeah but there isn't a a shot for shot like you know what i mean like 
retelling of the movie and or I'm sorry of the of the original IP because look at Watchmen. I love the comic. Yeah, I love the comic. The movie was boring, even though it was. The think, cool. what, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We going, we going. We might have to fight on this. You thought I, the movie was boring? I thought the movie was boring. I I saw the ultimate version, and I thought that was better. Mm -hmm. I just recently saw the animated version, and that movie's way excellent because it had the same animation style as as the comic book. Yep, and, and it, it's just like to me, like. And this is why I honestly did not like the movie as much as I thought I was supposed to like it. Like, I, it was a weird time. I was just like, I don't want to like this movie as much as everybody else. And then I realized with age, I don't like period pieces, man. Okay. Like, like you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I don't yeah, like, yeah. I, I don't like movies that are, that are set in weird times. I don't like, like, I get it. Like Furiosa, uh, Furiosa. Like, yeah. I love the Mad Max that um that the character came from yeah yeah, yeah. Fury like the Road, the, yeah. the redux or the sequel yeah but furiosa i i'm like all right like like i don't like this weird placed movie where it's a prequel to a movie that i kind of like but then it's like i gotta pay so much attention to that it's not like an easy thing yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah. like um alien romulus yeah For those of you that haven't seen it go see it it's a fan service it's a movie that you literally can sit there and watch it as a fan of all the movies and as a person that never seen aliens before, okay. because they give you exposition, they explain what the threat is, and then they kind of move on and, and, and make, make the plot. It's a, essentially a scary movie. It was so easy to tolerate that. Um, like me and my, my wife watched it at home. Uh, cause uh, I got a copy of it. And she liked it to the point that we are going to probably see it in the theaters this weekend. And it was like, it's one of those situations that I'm like, man, that's a good movie. Yeah. A movie to me, a good movie to me, I have a wide range. It's on yeah. watchability and how much like it holds my attention. Okay. Like you might laugh at me. Yeah. I think the most watchable, watchable movies that we have in our, in our generation are the Fast and the Furious movies. Yeah. If I, I'm watching something on USA Network or TNT yeah. and Fast and the Furious is on, I'll leave it on. It doesn't yeah. matter what movie it is. It doesn't matter what point it is. I can sit there and be like, oh, man. And then sometimes I want to watch it, and then I'll pop in the DVD or the Blu-ray or yeah. my digital legal copy, and I'll watch it from the beginning because yeah. it's like those movies don't get old. Yeah. I mean, as as a guy who's seen just about every Fast and Furious movie opening night, because you know, I remember when Tokyo Drift came out, and I was there, and as soon as the movie got done, cars were peeling out and stuff like that. It's like it holds a specific memory in my brain. Then I get that. I get that. All right, man. So uh, as always, thank you, Marcos, for joining me. I appreciate. It. I'm always here and available to fill in or even be the third man on the two man team. You know, whatever you guys need me to. All right. Well, I mean, that's the latest episode of Surat and Chris's Movie Therapy Podcast. Once again, it is your boy Surat, aka Makazi. Marcos, let everybody know where they can find you. Um, you can find me at uh, XPod ninety seven with Megaran. You can find me on Instagram and and Twitter at the Sunset Kid five six. Um, you know, like like we always say on XPod ninety seven, get check out our merch. You can find it on my Twitter or. <laughs> or instagram account you know shout out always to roosevelt's you know always uh gearing us up like because we got to get you a roosevelt shirt man do you have any of those brother no not at all and I've, I've seen their stuff and i like their stuff i was actually i was actually looking at some of this stuff because i need good like i need good shirts to wear on the golf course you yeah. know a lot we're, of these gonna, golf shirts gonna, now we're gonna aren't. get you plugged in uh, you know, some we can't leave my man Saraf Mikazi out there in the Bro. dark, man. Listen, listen, I got I you you want me to blast that kind of stuff on social media? I will do that all day, every day. I'm all about you know pushing out stuff that you know that the the, the, the content creators that, that, that everybody just loves and like you know that speaks to me and my personality. So I'm all about that. Awesome, awesome. 
All right. Um, well, that's the latest episode of Sprout and Chris's Movie Therapy Podcast. Join us again next week where hopefully Chris is back and, you know, he's not feeling bad. But if he isn't, you know, we might have another special guest. We might have Marcos back. We might have a different guest host. Who knows? But, you know, until then, until next time, folks, just hit us back. Peace. Peace. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm a warrior. <laughs> <laughs>